Flag Show 7 p.m. Let's rise and open a meeting with the Pledge to the Flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Well, good evening. Tonight we have a pretty busy agenda, I think, board, and uh, you'll see in your packets a wide array of things, ranging from setting some public hearings for budget sessions next on our, at our April meeting to some good business events here. But what we do, I thought we'd do first is we have a special guest tonight, uh, John Penny, from the, uh, who's the chair of the Dutchess County uh, Census Committee, I'll call it. Uh, Every Vote Counts is the actual true name of the committee. Um, the county is working hard to make sure everybody gets counted this year, and John's been out and about on the hustings. I think we've seen him a few different places, but we thought for our board benefit and for our Panda viewers that watch Village of Red Hook meetings on Panda TV, we'd get you here too. I have a PowerPoint, and we'll get you up in a minute, but um, what I thought I could, you can give me the high sign, and I can switch the screens for you instead of you having to connect to your computer, and we'll get you in and out. But before we get into that, I thought let's just get the uh, minutes from the last few meetings reviewed and approved. They've been circulated to all of you digitally. We had our last monthly meeting, the main meeting, February 10th. Then we had two budget workshops, one February 20 and one February 27. Those have also been circulated. I reviewed them and they've been out for a time with you folks. Were there any other additions, alterations, or corrections? Hearing none, I would move that we accept those three sets of minutes. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Right, thank you. Yeah, while we're on a topic of minutes, as is our custom, um, if we hear and know of a village resident who passes away in the intervening month, we like to dedicate and separate a page in memorial of them in our minutes. And unfortunately, this month we all attended the wake and visited with the family of uh, Bill Crane, who passed away. Um, here about two weeks ago, so Bill was the husband of Sue Crane, who was long-term town elected official and town supervisor, and they both live here in the village, and Bill, uh, like I said, passed away, so I would ask that we consider that and leave a blank page in his honor and in his memory. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Thanks. <clears throat> and this is not a sad note, but I thought in a minute somehow we could memorialize. Um, I had the pleasure yesterday of attending two Eagle Scout uh, award ceremonies. One was an actual village resident and one I would consider an honorary village resident. One is Jordan Budd, whose dad owns Taste Buds here in the village and is active in a lot of different groups and committees here, including Boy Scouts of America. And then um, from our Heart Scrabble Committee, uh, Matt Donahue's boy, Christopher Donahue, um, also received the award. And uh, it was a great ceremony yesterday and it's really an accomplishment when you hear what they have to go through to get that. The only downside is they are an age where in about three months they leave for, well, maybe four or five months they leave for college. So they've uh, accumulated all this experience and skill sets, but they tend to move on. But uh, wherever they end up, they're going to bring a lot of knowledge and a lot of skill to whatever community they do settle in. But we'll have them around a little bit for the next, I guess, the summers or the next three or four years. But I'd just like to put a little note of appreciation and honor to them for that hard work. And it's Christopher Donahue and Jordan Budd. Thank you. That being said, we'll break our normal agenda to get John Penny up. John, let me hand you or get this handed to you. We use Panda TV direct mic to camera. So if you could speak into that and I'll work the screen for you and we'll get going. So hi, I'm John Penny. I'm the chair of what we call the Dutchess County Complete Count Committee. We've been uh, tasked with uh, raising awareness about the importance of people filling out the 2020 census. Uh, you're not. Oh, yeah. Let me go. John, you, you keep talking. I'll go to that console. I might be able to figure it out. There you go. There we go. Okay. Take two. <laughs> So hi, I'm John Penny. I'm chair of what we call the Dutchess County Complete Count Committee. 
We've been uh, tasked with raising awareness about the importance of people filling out the 2020 census. Uh, I'm going to give you just a quick history of who I am. I've been working for the government for just about a year now. I work under a unique partnership between Dutchess County governments and the city of Poughkeepsie, mostly under the broad heading of communications. I work mostly for the city of Poughkeepsie for the mayor, Rob Rollison, uh, but I get tasked with special projects uh, by the county executive and others uh, to handle some county work. And and uh, this, this is the biggest thing that I'm doing right now for the county by far. And uh, we've been out uh, since July actually doing this. And it was pretty interesting because uh, the first presentation I gave uh, was in Dover. And they're like, why do you want to talk about this now? And I said, because we really want to make sure we get to every municipality. You are the 27th, I believe. So we're going to get to all 30. And we're at a lot of different um, uh, events also like community days and, and music festivals. So we're not just doing municipal presentations, although that's a big part of it too. Um, briefly uh, before this, uh, I was the opinion editor at the Poughkeepsie Journal for about 20 years. So I know the Dutchess County and the area fairly well, um, but my, uh, from my coverage as a journalist. So wh when we talk about the census and why it's important and why, why do we do it and what it is, um, basically the census is something that we do every 10 years and the goal is to count everyone. And when we say everyone, we mean everyone. It doesn't matter of their legal status or any other consideration if they're breathing in, their, in the United States the goal is to count them. It's actually mandated in the Constitution. Um, and there are a number of good reasons why we do this. I'm going to give you the two most significant ones. The first one is after the count is done, we'll do what we call a reapportionment or a redistricting, a redrawing of, of congressional and other political lines. Um, so how the, these numbers end up shake out, shaking out is how we'll, we'll help, we'll partly determine what happens next in terms of how district lines are redrawn. Um, I would want to point out to you that before 2010, we used to have have three congressional representatives in this area, we now have two. I think that kind of explains, should explain to, to people the importance of, of the census and, and filling it out. But if that's not a good enough reason for you, um, there, there's another very good reason. Money's on the line, big money. $675 billion are at stake, actually. It involves about 132 programs, everything from housing to highway money to uh, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which we better known as SNAP, to Community Development Block Grants, which is something that should be near and dear to municipal hearts, uh, municipalities' hearts in particular, because you will be filling out those kind of grants to get, to get money from, again, anything from playgrounds to sidewalks. Uh, I want to just stop here to just briefly just reiterate this point that communities undercounted will get hurt and that's a message that you really need to send. I, I'm asking you, one of the reasons why I'm here is I'm asking you to talk to your uh, constituents and make sure that they, are, they understand how important this is. So I may have you convinced this is important, and so you might ask, well, how's this going to work, which is a great question. Uh, starting actually very soon, in the next week or so, people are going to be start getting what we call an invitation to fill out their census uh, through the mail. About 95% of us will be reached that way. Um, it will be uh, a, a, an invitation to fill out your form, and for the first time, it's not exactly the first time ever, but for the first time in a comprehensive way, you you uh, can fill out your form online. That's that's. Uh, this is something that's a very big part of the program this time around. You could also fill it out uh, um, uh, on the phone, through the phone, and th through the regular uh, form if you'd rather just fill out the, the form the old way. So that's an important point too. So other people won't get uh, an invitation by the mail mainly because they're in a, 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 that's very good. I'm sorry, you've been doing good and I haven't <laughs> cued you. I apologize for that. Um, most people will, um, well, the other people that won't get a, a form through the mail is because they're at a P.O. box. And this is important to note that the census tracks by address. So uh, th those people, will, the form will actually be delivered to their actual physical house or a field worker later on th in the process will, will come out and, and, and get to those people. So I'm on my Next slide. This just drills down, gives you a little bit more information about how ma when mailers will go out. You'll receive a number of ma mailers, three, um, and perhaps more if, if, if need be. 
Um, and the, the big thing to know about the census is that it's very persistent. It doesn't take no for an answer and with good reason. So what another message I like to convey to people is the best thing people can do is go online, fill this form out when they get the invitation. It will take you 12 or 15 minutes and get on with your life. Uh, if not, at some point, uh, a field worker will indeed come out to your door and knock on your door and try to get you to do it that way. So on that timeline, I'm going to stick with that timeline just for a second. Um, First ma mailers go out in March. Uh, April 1st is Census Day. That's a significant day for some people in terms of where they are actually located. The Census asks you where you are on April 1st. Um, but that date is becoming is more symbolic than anything else. The, some people think that they have to wait until April 1st to fill out the form. That is not true. You can fill out this form as soon as you get the invitation. The later uh, invitations will come out in, in April, uh, and if you haven't um, replied by then, that's when the field workers start going out, and they start going out at the end of April, early May. And they'll actually be out there from May, June, all the way until July, although we'd like to think that it's all going to be wrapped up before then. So this is a really important slide, um, and something, again, I'd hope that you can convey to people that uh, the census is indeed confidential. Matter of fact, the U.S. Census is it's basically a one-way street. It's not a two-way street. It can, it, it can ask for information from any federal agency that it wants to and usually receive that information, but it cannot give that information or any information out to uh, other federal agencies if they wanted. The only, the only the raw data, the numbers go out, but the personal information stays with the census and it stays with the census for uh, your life expectancy, which maybe they should increase a little bit by now, but it's 72 years. So that's a really important point. Uh, another point about that, if someone was found to, to breach that confidentiality, they face a $250,000 fine or five years in prison. Um, this is an important point for a lot of people. I, I'll start with the Latino population, quite frankly. This is a, a, an issue when we, we, we reach out to them, we, we hear that this is a big concern, that they fear the information is going to be turned over, <clears throat> quite frankly, to ICE or to the Justice Department or something of that nature, and they'll be deported. But quite frankly, it, 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 it really goes beyond that um, because a lot of people have fears about privacy for a lot of different reasons. Mostly, if they have children, people are very reluctant to give out information about their children. So this is an important point to make when you're talking to people that the census, census is confidential. So I only have a few more uh, slides. I won't spend much time on this one. It basically says that the younger you are, the least likely you are to fill out the census. Um, I use this uh, slide as a reminder of myself and to remind other people that children are historically undercounted in the census, and there could be several reasons for that. One goes back to privacy. People don't want to give out information on their children. The other reason is that you may be filling out this form, and it may be a nine-month-old baby right by your, your on your knee when you're doing it, and you don't think it's germane to that person, but, but it, it, it certainly is. Again, I go back to the fact that these numbers are with us for 10 years. These numbers affect can affect uh, health care, um, you, know, you know, funding in, in some respects certainly can affect uh, what money you may get for a playground, which certainly affects your children. So it's really important that you count all your children, too, when you fill out the census. So just the last two slides. Um, we have a, a complete count committee. I'm very proud of this committee. It's a 15-person committee. It's a very robust and diverse committee. Uh, we've been up and running since July, uh, and when I talk about diversity, this committee has, uh, it, it, it runs the gamut from uh, the ethnic makeup of the committee. It has, we have four people who, have, who are bilingual that are doing outstanding work reaching out to our Latino population um, because we really think that's probably where we can make up the most that we, uh, gap in terms of people that aren't, haven't been filling out the census. We have what we call hard to count areas in Dutchess County. I'm here to say that your town is not one of them, so that's that's good for you. Uh, your, the history of this town uh, on the census that y your residents will get the form and they will fill it out for the most part. Uh, but we do have hard to count areas. They're mostly located in places like the north side of Poughkeepsie, between the arterials, which is particularly uh, a, a stronghold for um, a, a, our Latino population, um, for Do town of Dover, uh, parts of Beacon, parts of Fishkill, and um, and I'm missing one, uh, and uh, par parts of Amenia also. And what 
those places generally have in common, again, is a, is a higher Latino population, higher minority population, uh, people who are, uh, you, know, you know, higher poverty rates and lower education rates. Those are the commonalities that, that we tend to see in our hard to count areas. So we have committee members who have been um, doing outreach in our communities for decades. We have some who are young and really just been doing this kind of work for a couple of years, but they're in really strategically important loca lo locations like the north side of Poughkeepsie. And we're actually doing a forum tomorrow at a place called the Black Heritage Club uh, on the north side of Poughkeepsie. And uh, we're doing, we're doing, we've done a lot of work to try to get people right from that immediate area, which is a hard to count area to come to this forum. So on that, I'll just end with the my, my last slide, which tells you how to get a, a hold of us, we do. Have, we have shortened uh, that uh, that link. It's duchessny.gov/census2020, um, and again, you can reach us at complete count at duchessny.gov. And I'll just end by saying that the uh, the census needs workers. It's it's hiring field workers. It's paying pretty good money, twenty three dollars an hour. The last I checked in this area, um, it's it's part time. It's flexible. You basically get to choose your own hours, and it's free training. And you could learn more about that at twenty twenty census dot gov slash jobs. And on that, I appreciate you having me here. I'll take any questions, and I'll take questions from the public if you'll allow it. Sure, I had one quick question. When you do it online, how long does it take a person to complete it? About 12 or 15 minutes. It depends on how many people you have in your family. Anybody else from the board? I was a census worker the last go round, and it was a great job. I actually was, I think I worked here, I think I worked at the school, and I did the census, and it was a great, flexible job. And I actually <coughs> lost eight pounds from all the walks. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> Did you find any people? Like, uh, I, I cannot tell you for the next mm. 72 years. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Touche. Trick so, question. Huh? So w w when we get the invitation, do we also get the form to fill out? You, what you get, thank you for that. You, you get a 12 uh, number code, so you can go and a website to go to. You go to the website, you punch in your number, and the census form will come up for you. So you have to print it out yourself then? Excuse me. You had to print it if you wanted to fill it out longhand. Yeah, you could. Well, yes. Or you could. You could actually. Um, they could send it to you too uh, through the mail. You go. Or you could wait till the field worker comes out. Quite frankly, but yeah. The, what we really want people to do is fill this out online. It's going to be the most cost-effective way uh, for this to occur and the easiest way for this to occur. I think for us on the village board, we're somewhat mystified because. In between the 10 years, we apply for block grants and different things, and we've been told that our median household income has gone up and we're pushed into a certain category where we don't get as much access to federal money under HUD and block grants. And, uh, that's right. We're always not quite sure, because that's done through like random sampling through the ACA, but we prefer if our people did complete the census and we get the right uh, household income data. If you're off by a couple, if you're off by 1,000 people or 500 people, it's going to be millions of dollars over 10 years you're going to be losing. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about are that. Are the towns sorted differently from the villages, or are the villages included within the town? It goes by census track, um, and so I'd have to look at that. There's, uh, it, it's possible that a census track includes both, but I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. It's a good question, though. Okay, I think we're good. Anybody out there? Thank you, John. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, we'll switch gears and you can go. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Unless you want to stay, just for a <laughs> oh. okay. Can Jennifer and Charles get the microphones closer? Hmm. Hey, we have to a. Say something to <laughs> He speaks with a Scottish brogue, so you can pick him up there. I don't know. But um, yeah, we have a panda guy who actually directs tonight. That's pretty good. <laughs> Anyway, we'll move from uh, Census 2020 to our regular meeting. Welcome, March 9th, 2020. And um, today outside, it was about 70 degrees. And it's, what, six or, uh, I guess, what, uh, 11 days till St. Patrick's Day. With, uh, so we're getting the mood of spring going here in the village. I actually put on a greenish shirt. To, like We won't be on Panda again before St. Patrick's Day, so I had to wear a little green. But, uh, so it'll be fun. We got a... Uh, the normal business, and then uh, we'll do.
do our committee reports first, our regular business, and public comment after. Uh, we have no actual public hearing tonight, anything. So uh, we'll go through our normal routine. Agendas are out for anybody new in the audience. But as always, we open with uh, looking at the finances and the treasurer's report. I can go over that for you folks. It's submitted by the treasurer. But as of today, we're showing in your packet there, account balances, general fund $168,660, water fund $66,136. But I will call your attention, as always, um, in the water fund, we also have to consider, um, I don't know if it's here, we have the Village Green Hearts Grab, Health Insurance Sewer Fund, Capital Projects. Do you have the reserve? That's down in the reserve checking balances. Okay. That for water, am I seeing that there, Cindy? <laughs> the, the balance, the USDA water balance. Let's see, there it is, M&T, 110,000. So for our purposes, the two account balances, the 66 one and 110,420 would be uh, our really active working balance in water. In trust and agency, we have $18,667. Petty cash, $71. Village Green, $4,149. Hard Scrabble, $4,243. Health insurance, $6,325. Sewer fund, $30,260. And going through the reserve checking balances, which we're now having a treasurer show us this. Our department reserve balance is $5,018. Police reserve balance, $14,540. I mentioned the USDA short-term asset fund. That's the 110,420. The highway reserves $20,723. Snow reserve $3,265. Tower reserve $17,700. Unemployment reserve $4,541. Court reserve $3,296. And an account we located called the office reserve $971.95. The expenses for the month are out in the voucher packets. Uh, come to $108,034. That's for the general fund. The water fund, the expenses were $31,780. Trust and agency expenses were $18,667. And sewer had an expense of $6,331. I know in the general fund packets, we did see, I think we made one, one interest payment on one of our bonds is 22,000 ish there. Water. Pardon me? Water. Water? Okay. So that 108 is 20, that was in the water, that was a water payment, yes, excuse me. So in the 31, it was a $22,000 interest payment. I started to go through, right now we're at 75% of year. So this is our custom, you should go through the actual detail sheets and see who and what is at budget or above budget. and. Um, we can advise those that are over, and uh, we do have, I think, the good fortune, knock on wood, of maybe the snow events are over. I hate to say it, but usually in March we get one maybe blizzard late in the month. But, um, but that line, snow equipment, snow materials, and snow personal services is a little performing because we just haven't had all the expenses. So probably another month or two we can look at reallocating that to some of the lines that are over. Um, but I have gone through and we can just discuss that more. We do that in our budget workshops and work on closing any gaps. That being said, the clerk treasurer, we have what, April, Mar half of March to go, April, May. Um, our fiscal year ends May 31, so we have about two and a half months to go. Um, from a cash flow perspective, you, I think you have a sheet in your packets there. Um, what's still coming into the village 96 percent of the tax revenue is in and as you know the clerk circulates those who did not pay their taxes off to the county we get reimbursed by the county who moves properties if necessary into foreclosure uh, but things still to come in looks like according to the treasurer's calculations here about another four hundred and two thousand. that ranges from Sharing, sharing agreements we have on certain contractual items with the town of Red Hook, franchise fees, unpaid taxes, and um, transfers from the water accounts still will come in. So that's all looking pretty good, would you say? I mean, I think 
the 401. We just always have waiting mm. on a lot of income. Too. Yeah. The one thought we'll address later, I have something in your packets where the treasurer has submitted out to New York State the CHIPS reimbursement. It's roughly $81,000, and I have some thoughts which we'll address to, just to help us maintain cash flow. I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, that being said, I would ask that we accept the treasurer's report. Is there a second? Second. Did I hear a second? Second. Okay. Uh, any other discussion on while we got it out? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks. Let's see. I will do the police report for the month of February. We had a total of 428 incidents. Breakout is 321 in the village, 103 in the town of Red Hook, 4 in Tivoli. Tickets issued during the month equal 87, which seems to be about in the pattern we see month in, month out. Breakout is village 57, includes, got to be a mistake there, it says 30 parking tickets. I think whoever entered this meant three parking tickets. You'll see Town of Red Oak has three tickets. I think somebody manually entered it and back, did it backwards here. I will consider it to be 57 tickets in the village, 30 in the town, and three parking tickets. That's usually more in line with our occurrences, but we can confirm that tomorrow with the clerk from the police department. In some, there were six arrests in a month. There were three in the village, three in the town. And again, the detail sheet is attached. I know we did reach out. Um, the police labor contract comes to fruition the end of May this year, which syncs up with our fiscal year. We have provided data to the union, but I haven't heard of a request to set a meeting yet. We'll have to work on that because it's getting pretty close to the end of May. And uh, we do budget with certain presumptions and tax caps in mind, which are things we would negotiate with. But I'll keep you posted when things start. Mr. Uh, Trustee Trapp, are you in order there to talk about some planning and zoning? Yes, sir. I, I Since we have a relatively full agenda, I'll be brief. Uh, very quickly, <clears throat> our uh, Dutchess County Planning Federation Board of Directors classes uh, registration is opening up 331. We have three classes in one evening, floodplain regulations, skills that make great uh, boards, and number three would be special use permits. That's five bucks a class or per class or Ten bucks, you can either take two or all three. It's up to you. And most of the classes are presented by uh, New York State uh, local government uh, officials there. Uh, 4.30 is the next class. It's one single class, affordable housing, ins and outs, and sailor, Mary Lynch and Ken Carney. Uh, that was a reschedule from last year. And the last uh, class we have uh, is going to be June 30th. Uh, 5G wireless pointers and pitfalls for land use boards. Uh, we're going to have uh, Nicholas Ward Willis, Drew Victoria um, Gamils, I think, Michael Musso, three, going to be presenting that. And uh, Brent and I and uh, Ray Toll have been meeting uh, pretty much every Friday diligently working on the, the various pieces of the zoning. I'll uh, let Brent chat a little more about that when we get to that point and for planning and zoning uh, in the month of February 2020 one building permit was issued four certificates of compliance were issued uh, three municipal searches were conducted there were three stop work orders issued uh, 22 fire inspections were conducted one complaint uh, let's see planning board actions February 13th 2020 uh, one item uh, let's see, uh, tabled a minor subdivision and uh, zoning board February 27, 2020 meeting for continuation of an area variance application public hearing. And let's see, we took in $1,100 in the month of February in planning and zoning office. And Mr. Mayor, that is it. Thank you, sir. I know one of our audience members might be interested in the status of the zoning. Brent will be talking about that in a few minutes. Um, let's see. I think 
we could go to uh, some of the fun stuff and some of the dirty stuff. Would so that be garbage. Th- no, garbage that'd be the fun that's stuff? The, uh, let's go to celebrations and materials management. Okay. Ms. Nars. All right. Well, Ed has the poster up for our annual egg scramble, which, weather permitting, will be Saturday, April 4th. Uh, it starts at 11. Our egg hunt is at noon. I always joke that it's from like noon to, or from 12 to 12.01. <laughs> um, there will be an adaptive egg hunt at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, if you need uh, or would like to participate in that, please contact the library for that. Uh, we'll have Easter basket raffles, crafts, face painting, and the egg scramble. It's on the Linden Avenue um, lawn, as always. And always a good time. What else we got? Uh, Apple Blossom Day will be Saturday, May 9th. Uh, This is an annual festival that is not run by us, but is run by the Red Hook Rotary. Uh, So you will contact them if uh, you're interested in becoming a vendor. Uh, What we do do is Hard Scrabble Day, which we're working on. Uh, I think we have a meeting this week, in fact. It will be Saturday, September 12th. Please note this is actually a date change. We normally do it on the third Saturday of September, um, but due to holidays, we're doing it on Saturday, September 12th. Uh, We're always looking for volunteers, uh, particularly in the parade. So if anyone would like to help us out, uh, please let us know. Um, And then the really fun stuff, which would be materials management. We don't have a poster for that. Um, For the month of February, we sold $2,349 in garbage tags and paid out $671.01. We had 6.13 tons of garbage and 2.8 tons of recycling, which breaks down as 1.13 tons of commingled, 0.61 tons of cardboard, and 1.06 tons of paper. Uh, And just a reminder, we alternate weeks, um, cardboard and newspaper one week, and then commingled uh, the next. And that's it. Good. Thank you. Just looking at... At our budget workshop, we're trending the materials management, revenue, and expenses. And it looks like it this month's pretty much standard with the rest of the months there. Thank you, Jen. Let's see. I don't have as nice a graphic for the water department report, but um, Charlie's been traveling a little bit. But before you go, Charlie, um, I tried to circulate off two things. One was the normal paperwork we get, and then our operator gave us a cover note, which when Charlie makes his report, we try to understand and determine the cycle of daily water consumption. So I don't know, if Charlie, if you got a chance to read that yeah. for, for an yeah. email. Okay, so just we could talk about it after you go, but Charlie, you want to give us the water update? Sure. Uh, so... During the month of February, the water treatment facility treated 6,960,300 total gallons, which is an average of 240,000 gallons per day, which is up at the sort of top end of our uh, sort of annual use. Um, So uh, we also sent out three samples uh, for environmental analysis to check on uh, bacteriological (coughs) contamination, and none was found, which is always reassuring. Um, And so we also have that, yeah, that memo from um, our uh, water managers suggesting that it's, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we have these uh, surprising uh, readings is that one of the main meters might not be accurately uh, recording flow, which is problematic. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we'll get that fixed or figured out very soon. Yeah, good. I'll recap a little further. It should be in your package, everybody, but it's dated today, March 9th, because we've been leaning on the operator look into this for us. There's another piece of data I've been asking for, but we do not have it, but he's saying that they're going to take the daily readings a different way and work on this meter. Um, it's, it's, I'm a little surprised that they haven't done this earlier. It's, it's not a cost factor per se, that's, but we're trying to measure gallons pumped to gar- gallons sold, and if we can't get the right measure on gall- gallons pumped uh, out of the ground, we're, in, we're, we're not in a strong position. So anyway, 
looks as I read this, they seem to have identified a problem with the main flow meter that measures what's going off to the storage tanks. And um, we would expect they'll have to correct it. It's We fund it, but uh, they have to tell us what's wrong, and then they have to fix it. So um, I don't know where it's going to end up as far as we were seeing daily rates more like 180,000 gallon per day, which we think is probably still the real number. We can't explain the 240. We're concerned their leak. We still have no leak discovered. So anyway, we're going to have to keep the pressure on the operator, and uh, we'll do that and see what we have by the end of the week. But it's not great. Anyway, um, anything else, Charles? We, I know we're circulating a little bit on our LED streetlight project, but we'll let you catch up on that, I guess. It's, um, the, the, um, the New York Power Authorities sending me all kinds of questionnaires and the only guy keeps leaning on me but we have not signed a contract with them yet or anything we're just waiting to see if the, the maintenance contract right you were still waiting for more information on the the maintenance, the maintenance contract, contract side of things and we did get something but to be honest it didn't quite answer my question so we'll let this keep leaning and if you could look into that a bit charlie too all right thank you charles it looks like if we are Everybody's done, but Deputy Mayor Kowalczyk with his sequence of reports. Are you ready to go, Brent? Yep, I am. Uh, start with the Village Green Committee, um, related budget accounts, community beautification. We have $2,672, shade tree contractual, $1,500, and the Village Green checking account, $4,192.82. We did have a Village Green committee meeting on February 29th and we're starting our preliminary preparations for the annual spring planting and Arbor Day celebration. So we've already compiled a preliminary list of tree sites. Um, they would include Fraley Street, North Broadway, Fifth Street, Park Avenue, Old Post Road, and Church Street. We still have to confirm with the residents and businesses on, on those locations. And anyone interested in Having a tree planted or volunteering for planting days or making a donation to the Village Green Committee can contact David Pearson, the village clerk, or myself. Uh, the Village Highway Department, I will dispense with the uh, reading of the Village Snow Ordinance and uh, adjoining sidewalk snow removal, other th to say that it goes out of effect on March 31st. Hopefully we won't have snow between now and then. Um, the Village Board of Trustees is considering purchasing tools and equipment for the Village Highway Water and Materials Management Department. We're still discussing that in our in our committee meetings. And revenue from the sale of scrap metal was received on January 29th for the amount of $346.40. Uh, total revenue generated for this fiscal year is $1,899.15. Since the be beginning of this program in September of 2007, $30,606.62 has been generated. And the proceeds of this program go toward the purchase of tools and equipment for the Village Highway Water Materials Management Departments. Anyone interested in donating scrap metal can contact the Highway Department at 758-8600 or the Village Clerk. And the Village will pick up scrap metal upon request. Um, the Red Hook Infrastructure and Intermunicipal Task Force monthly report we we'll start with the Reddick Sewer Project. Meetings were held on February 7th, 14th, 21st, and 28th in the Reddick Village Building. We reviewed the easements for accuracy. We reviewed the status of eminent domain proceedings on four properties on East Market Street. Discussed design alternates, additional project cost implica implications, and additional regulatory approvals that may be necessary to settle agreements with property owners. The Village of Reddick submitted an application to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation for the State Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or SPEEDES, permit for the proposed transfer and modification of the Reddick Commons Wastewater Treatment Facility. Um, public comments were submitted up through uh, March 2nd, and I believe the, pub the public comment period is now over. We're still waiting, I believe, for the affidavit from the Poughkeepsie Journal. No, we got that. We got that, and that's been submitted? That's been sent to council. Yeah. And um, that was, we are waiting on that. Then Now they're gonna start processing that, and we should, we should uh, uh, attain approval from the DEC um, 
this month. On February 21st, Ron Miller of the Dutchess County Department of Health delivered approved plans, specifications, and the basis of design report to the village of Red Hook. Mayor Blundell signed the documents, um, which were approved by the DOH on February 20th, and he signed them on the 21st. So that was a 22-month-long process, and we're happy to say that it's now over and we're moving forward. So we did have a projected timeline for the project, and this, again, this is projected, but we are expecting final DEC approval early April, um, the bids to be advertised hopefully in late April of this year. Um, the bid period and open bids and award contracts sometime in July or August of this year. We're hoping to start construction in September of 2020. Substantial completion is, is expected in December of 2021 with final completion in May 2022. So we're, we're hoping to stay on track with that project. Um, the Route 9 Old Farm Road Water Main Loop Project meetings were held on February 7th, 14th, and 28th in the Village Building, and we reviewed the status of the Dutchess County Department of Health approvals, contractual agreements, and easements between the Village of Red Hook and participating property owners. Um, the Village of Red Hook Distribution Systems and Administrative Services Improvements Project uh, meetings were held on February 7th, 14th, and 21st. We reviewed the past billing for accuracy and completeness. We reviewed lists of meters, malfunctions, and repairs. And we are preparing, along with our village engineer, Delaware Engineering, um, a hydrant flushing and valve exercising schedule. On the task force side, um, both Charlie and I sit on the intermunicipal task force as village representatives. The task force met on February 7th, 14th, and 28th in the Red Hook Town Hall, and we reviewed and discussed the proposed amendments to the Town of Red Hook zoning law to permit short-term rentals in certain town zoning districts. We also met with Red Hook Town Planner Michelle Gregg to review residential accessory use charts for Class 1, 2, and 3 short-term rentals and annual operating permits. So we're still working on short-term rentals. Some of the other committees, real quickly, there were no committee meetings of the Town of Reddick Zoning Review Committee or the Community Preservation Fund Advisory Board. Um, the current balance of the Community Preservation Fund as of February 29th is $1,357,721.18. Uh, the Saukeel Watershed Community, um, a meeting was held on February 19th in the Elmendorf Inn. Discussion centered on the role that community science plays in environmental decision making. The discussion was led by Emily White, who is the visiting research associate at Bard College with the Center for the Study of Land, Air, and Water, and research associate at Hudsonia. The Town of Red Hook Local Revo Waterfront Revitalization Program Working Group, or LWRP, met on February 18th in the town hall. And we looked at the New York State Department of State Coastal Management Program, state coastal policies, and we are currently reviewing both policy one, um, which is to restore, revitalize, and redevelop deteriorated, un underutilized waterfront areas for commercial, industrial, cultural, recreational, and other compatible uses. Um, policy 1A was as a local one to encourage growth of tourism sector of the town economy. Um, policy two, which is to facilitate the siting of water dependent uses and facilities on or adjacent to coastal waters. Um, the Northern Dutchess Alliance Executive Committee, which I am a member of, um, met on February 7th in the Reddick Village Building. And we were preparing for the annual breakfast and awards ceremony, which was held on February 26th at the Beekman Arms in Rhinebeck. Uh, the following were presented, the short-term rentals, an assessment of Northern Duchess presented by James Levy, the principal of Planning for Places. Uh, commitment to community award was presented to Nancy Kelly, who is the Rhinebeck Town Historian, and charting our course awards presented to Brand Kendall, who is the Duchess County Clerk, Dr. William P. Tatum III, Duchess County Historian, and Craig Marshall, who chairs the Duchess County 
Historical Society Vice President Program. It was a good breakfast, both, both, Ed, both Ed and I attended. Uh, the Village of Red Hook Zoning Review Committee, um, Ray Toll, Larissa Delango, Jay, and myself all sit on that. Um, we met in the Village Building on February 7th and 28th. We reviewed and revised the proposed amendments to Article 5, Section 200-38 of Signs and Billboards of the Supplemental Regulations. And we proposed amendments to Article 2, uh, Section 200-5, which are definitions, which we also discussed. A public hearing was held on February 20th to hear all interested parties on the proposed Local Law 1 of 2020, entitled the Local Law to Amend the Official Zoning Map of the Village of Red Hook and make other associated changes. The public hearing is closed, but we were um, accepting written comments. And I believe you're still re we're still right. we're still receiving written comments. Right? Now, then the 21 days was March 5th. All right, so we're done with that. We did receive some. Uh, the proposed local law amends the zoning map to eliminate the highway business district, extends the general business district east along Route 199 and extends the neighborhood mixed-use district south along Route 9 and a section of 5th Street. Existing residential uses within the general business district may continue as conforming uses. The text of the zoning law is proposed to be amendment, amended to be consistent with the zoning map. And that is it. Thank you. I don't think it totally matters, but on your one of your last dates, a public hearing we held it on February 10th, you read the 2020 part as a 20, I think so. Not Just 10. so that was our last monthly meeting, February, the February meeting 10, just so people know. So that was the, where the 21 days stepped off from after we closed the public hearing. And as Brent mentioned, we did get some comments and they've been circulated to the board and to the ZRC. And um, I know we have that as a separate line item later in the agenda, but thank you, Brent. What we could do, that concludes department and committee reports. We could head into regular business. You'll see we covered the census presentation already. I thought I would just show the audience and the board we've been working on. Tomorrow will be another conference call with the County of Dutchess, Department of Health, and Office of Emergency Services. I guess technically it's the Department of Emergency Response. Um, what we're doing is staying in touch with them since they're our local point of contact for any COVID, coronavirus issues, questions, and so forth. What we did to centralize and consolidate things on our Village of Red Hook website, we put a link for folks. We don't pretend or could never be experts on this. We would rely on the Department of Behavioral and Community Health, which is the accurate real name for Dutchess County Department of Health. And this contains a link right here which will take you right into their site and they keep an updated message so any folks that want to head for our site there are certainly other ways to get here and like I said we're not going to mimic or pretend to develop any of our own information that would we would send it off to these folks and I'll do a conference call tomorrow um, and keep everybody up to date and if things warrant it we would get word out and so forth to our community Right now, we're still intending to do the egg scramble. It's an outdoor event, and right now, nothing is happening right locally. But uh, we would keep, yeah, you know, we get the word out if that were to change or in any way, also. But it is outside in the sunshine and not not inside the buildings. But I just want to show folks that, and it's one of the attributes of our new website. We can internally get these links ourselves without having to go off to a web administrator, which is pretty nice. So what we could do is um, some general business here. Set public hearing is one of the agenda items there. This one is for the tax cap override. The board and regular attendees will recall that this year the tax cap is 1.78%. We've been working and striving to keep our requested increase below that number. And right now it looks like it's there, but we also give ourselves the protection of an ability to exceed it, which involves something we've done every year for the past probably six years ever since the tax cap came out um, we essentially pass a local law to give ourselves the ability to exceed the tax cap we prepare and develop our budget pass our budget and 
make every attempt to keep it under the tax cap, and then we rescind the local law. So we put it in place more as a protective arrangement. And one reason is I'd still like to do it is, although we have every great intention, who knows with certain developments outside our control, I don't anticipate anything, but we, I'd like to still have that as an option for us. So in your packets, it's an unnumbered resolution. We could ask the clerk to give us a number, but essentially it says, whereas the Village of Reddick budget for fiscal year 2020-2021 is to be presented to public hearing prior to adoption, whereas the tentative version of the budget will be presented to the clerk and board members within the requisite time frame, but unforeseen events can occur that impact the tentative budget, whereas the next monthly meeting of the Village Board is April 13. I think that's House Calendar person there. Is that the right date? Therefore, be it resolved, the Village will schedule a public hearing on the local law to allow a property tax levy in, in excess of the tax cap on April 13 at 7 p.m., and the clerk will publish notice in the Kingston Freeman. So, um, and we've, I've attached the local law. It's the boilerplate that we've used other years. Um, essentially, the legislative intent, it is the intent of the local law to allow the village of Red Hook to adopt the budget for the fiscal year commencing June 1, 2020, that requires a real property tax levy in excess of the tax levy limit as defined by GML section 3-C. But I don't want anybody to panic. I think all our goals, all our intents is not to have to exercise this. But in our scheme, our, our budget, 1.78% increase equate, equates to about $22,000, $23,000 we can play with. And a lot of that is already taken up by our health insurance increases that were beyond our control. So a little bit of workers' comp policy increase, a little bit of planned and contract relationships with our organized labor folks. So we don't have a lot of wiggle room and we still have to rely on a lot of grants to do the things we really want to do, but we'll try to keep it within that. So anyway, I would ask Kirk, did you give us a number on that? Six. Six. Um, I would move that we set a public hearing to address the potential need for our ability to uh, exceed the tax levy cap limit. Um, is there a second? Second. second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks. So it's going to be 7 o'clock. And while we're in the mood for public hearings that same night. Just, just keep in mind, everybody, uh, are you you're going to vote on the budget that night? And well, approve it? what were you going to say? That's well, because I'm not around a lot. I'm going the last two weeks in May, and when I yeah. get back, so I have to prepare the taxes very early and hope the county well, cooperates. Well, here's our my intention. We'll also set a public hearing number two for that same night right. to review and approve the budget. Right. So the, the tenant budget gets sent out to everybody on the board. Then we can make additions and changes. But if there are any, they, are, they require public discussion, public meeting, and votes. Uh, we meet collegially and collectively to try to work all that out beforehand. Um, <laughs> So the second public hearing will be that. It's going to be a busy April meeting because that's also our reorganizational meeting. <coughs> so there's like a lot going on because our fiscal and our calendar years are all starting and ending, and it's going to be crazy. But, um, but fortunately, the way we do the budget, we're all pretty well versed in it before. It's not like everybody's seen it for the first time that night, so we're all good. I think it'll be good. Um, I'll do my best. But we'll do um, – we'll get it. You know, the goal would be there are definite deadlines we have to have it done by. Like, it's um, if we don't do it by May 1, if we have it, don't do it by May 1, it, the tentative budget becomes the budget. And it's, uh, but anyway, I have in your packets somewhere um, it's another one to set a public hearing for the journal budget. We have, whereas the village of Reddick budget for fiscal year 2021, 20 20 2020 to 2021 is to be presented in public hearing prior to adoption. Whereas the tentative version of the budget will be presented to the clerk and board members within the requisite time frame, whereas the next monthly meeting of the village board is April 13th, therefore it be resolved the village board will schedule a public hearing on the tentative budget on April 13, 2020 at 7.15 p.m. Clerk will publish notice in the Kingston Freeman. I think one word I'd like to take out of there is public hearing on the budget. It's, the word tentative doesn't really belong there. So can you strike that, Ms. Clerk? And um, I would offer it. It must be resolution number seven. Mm -hmm. Second. Uh, and uh, any other discussion? All in favor? 
Aye. Thank you. Okay. This is an easy one. Um, periodically, we have village property that we move to surplus and sell through absolute auctions, which is a shared service vendor that we use with Dutchess County. They've historically got, got, we've received pretty good return on our items we sell through there. We had um, the 2016 Ford Interceptor. It was involved in a total loss crash about a year ago, and we've collected from the insurance and uh, <coughs> taken what we need off it and want to move that through the auction. Um, to be honest, I'm reading the word a 2016 Ford Intercept. Uh, I don't know. I didn't bring anything with me. Is this like the right year of that yes. car? Yeah, okay. Um, this seems like a long time ago. It seems like they're relatively new cars. But um, I would ask for the board to approve that we move the total loss uh, Ford Interceptor to absolute auction. And I'll explain a little bit more. We decided to keep the salvage to take certain things off it and didn't collect from the insurance company. They didn't pay us the salvage value and take it. We, so we're going to try to move it into the auction ourselves. So I move that it be declared surplus and move through absolute auction. Is there a second? Second. Any other thoughts, discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks. We referred to the general business district uh, neighborhood mixed use zoning map changes. I thought we'd briefly comment tonight, maybe if the two members president of the DRC wanted to give us, Brent touched on it in his report, but we took public comment and we're weighing that. Uh, we do have to do a seeker and we do have to get the 239M back from the County of Dutchess. I haven't seen that come in yet, have you? We haven't gotten it back. We gotta make a call. Yeah. Uh, we've spoken to them. Um, Brent and J Jay, you want to give us a little update where we're at? Or uh, As far as the <clears throat> direct changes to the general business district or to the NMU that we aired out at the uh, last public hearing, we really haven't uh, done anything new in with respect to those particular changes directly, but uh, indirectly we've been going over um, a uh, number of the, the uh, sign regulations to, uh, I guess, uh, clean things up and address some complaints from uh, residents as well as planning board members who have been felt like that they have been uh, passing certain items on their agenda and they haven't been adequately enforced or have been uh, av avoided. So we're, we're trying to tighten up on that. Uh, and your zoning regulations live by definition. So we've been creating tons of definitions and poor Ray Toll, we've given him the, uh, the goal of reorganizing the, uh, the sign regulation and, and uh, it would be a, a difficult task for anyone and Ray's doing a wonderful job at this point on it. He's, he's struggling through it and we're giving him hell the whole time, so. <laughs> All right. Good. And we, we've also been reviewing. We've got we received several written comments. Plus, we had a public hearing on the revised neighborhood mixed use district and the general business district. And we went over the comments and it took them very seriously and look at alternatives. And um, along with that, we were also recommended by our attorney to look at a couple planners to help us with the the seeker process. So we have reviewed two proposals from two separate planners and i think we made a recommendation to the mayor on that one and um i think that will the planner will be very helpful in our deliberations especially on the nmu district so we're hoping to move it ahead as soon as we can on that we're waiting for the county at this point and we have to go through seeker and um so as soon as we can get a planner on board that would be very beneficial I think to both the ZRC and also the Board of Trustees. Okay, I just want to accentuate, just so everybody hears it, the continued comment, we did get written comment, but essentially from folks that were here at the public hearing, and we have reached out and actually had to sit down face-to-face -face sessions with a few of them, um, just trying to explain the benefits and perceived benefits from our perspective. Um, so we were, like Brent and Jay say, we take that very seriously. I do, one thing Jay mentioned um, with the sign, that's not 
in front of us right now. That's still a proposal still to come. It's not any. It's not related to the GBD and MU work we're doing. Uh, that'll be a secondary step later on. Uh, we're not trying to roll that in and slow things down. One one thing I'd like to say, Jay, when you mentioned the members of the planning board, folks have been advised that our zoning re review committee is looking at modifying our sign ordinances. Um, and we do feel that the street is really, really fragile and to start violating individual property owners, business owners, while we're also in the middle of looking at modifying our codes would not be productive and not be helpful. So um, we have tried to convey that to the planning board members. Um, they are administrative body, not an executive body. So um, we're, we're looking at that, but we, we take their comments seriously, but um, we're, if we make some changes, that'll be in the near future. Uh, it'd be, I don't think it makes sense to be violating folks if we're gonna change that immediately. Um, so the ZRC did submit a recommendation on a planner. We do go by, uh, it was a bid type number. The, the one bidder is a little higher than another. I can make a call, see if one wants to match up, um, get the best price out of each of them. And then when you guys meet next, we can have, which would be this Friday, right? We could have an answer for you. That just firmed up last Friday as far as where you guys wanted to go with that. So anyway, let's see. What I could do too is um, one thing that's brewing when Brent reports um, on the town level, the short-term rental hosted, unhosted issue. And short-term rental is a key code word for Airbnb, VRBO, HomeAway. It's the composite name for whoever um, is, is in the short-term housing rental market. One thing I think the village needs to consider, and we've been actively attending EDC meetings, me, myself, there, um, the Northern Duchess Alliance indicated that the county tourism value is $642 million a year, and we know here with Bard and Omega and certain things, we get a fair amount of that, and we have no hotels here, so we want to monitor and make sure the town doesn't strangle us in an overly strict ordinance. By that I mean we, as the village, do everything we can to keep our street vibrant and alive as far as the businesses and the, the uh, activity activity level for our residents. So um, right now the town from the ITF, the task force, they're being reported out certain findings, which looks like they would essentially do away with all unhosted short-term rentals yeah. except yeah. in the Ag Business District. So right now short-term rentals in the town of Red Hook are not permitted. So well, what, the, what the task force is doing, just to be Mm. Fair and honest is permitting short-term rentals. So this is a town issue, not a village issue. Well, no, it becomes point. village for two reasons. One is I think our street, our merchants and our restaurants really depend on the activity and the tourism around us. We don't have the housing to give anybody. We have the home compliance, host compliance shows 79 STRs in the town and six in the village. So we can't support the volume. And the other argument, STRs did not exist before what, maybe 10 years ago? I'm not sure when the first Airbnb raised its head. But but I just want to point out to the board that we do have a little bit of interest in this, and we are monitoring that. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, what I could switch gears, let's see. Online payment update in your packets should be. Um, let's see if I can find it. VPS. Um, as a board, we've been talking for quite a time on how to get more modern and get online bill payments via credit card or um, other electronic uh, automatic check checking count, uh, what is it, EC, ACH, automatic check clearance, whatever the acronym is for that. Um, and we've been also looking for a way to save our inside staff paperwork and time required to make it happen. We reached out to different banking entities, different, I'll say, private market vendors that have, we've interviewed. And turns out the best option we've discovered is right here. We use Software Consulting Associates. They do our water and our tax programs. That's the software that we use to generate bills and keep our financial records. Um, they have a sister company called VPS, which is Verified Payment Systems. And in your packets, I have an agreement there. We 
essentially this VPS at no charge to the village has direct interaction capability with SCA. What that means is a person paying from home does a lot of the legwork to get the account identified. Things happen behind the scenes, not even in our office where the water account or a tax account is credited. And each night we get a spreadsheet entry from whoever paid their bills overnight. And within 48 hours, we get automatic fund transfer to our water or a general fund, depending on what they're, they're paying. Um, it would be based uh, at a couple of markers on our village website that would move the folks into the software consultants data screens where they would enter their account numbers and so forth and move it forward. If we've had council look at this, it's, it's gone back and forth. Like I said, there's no cost to the village. We're not looking to underwrite or absorb the cost of the person. It's not going to be mandatory. It's going to be voluntary. So those of a particular type that want to pay it from home, there will be a fee, a convenience fee, whatever you want to call it, to use the credit card. I'll describe that in a minute. But it does not, the village is not absorbing that, like I said, or underwriting it. Neither are we marking up our product costs. We're just sending the water bill or the tax bill. It also has some application for our garbage tag payment system where folks could come in and there'd be a desktop um, card machine where uh, staff could accept credit cards. Um, which is kind of computer terminal type linkage to our, our system. Um, what I'd like to do, we've been talking about for quite a while, and if you look in the packet, you'll see some of the key things that the public would want to know, but I can't stress enough that we're not forcing this, and nobody has to use it unless they want, and it's not costing us to put it on our website or anything. Um, the fee for utility payments, which would be water and garbage, would be 2.65% or a minimum $2. For tax payments, the fee is the same, 2.65%. And then there's a, a minimum credit card, let's see, excuse me, a service fee of $3.50. Um, whether a person chooses to pay their water or tax bill with that, it's their call. Like we've said in some of our workshop meetings, some folks, especially younger generation, might be wanting to build air miles or hotel points or whatever by use of certain credit cards. and. If they want to, I think we should let them. And if we can, the big thing to me is it'll solve a lot of work issues in our office. Because, like I've said to a bunch of you, we mail out about 900 water bills, we bring in 900 envelopes, and process 900 receipts, and go to the bank with $120,000 worth of cash checks every quarter, you know, four times a year. So I think there's some interesting ways. I think it will also make us more in a 20 first century here. Um, the point of contact, what's really nice to me is that they're sister company to our billing service, our software consultants, which they're based right in the chocolate factory. Their owner has sold some of the interest of his company to a, a larger company, but he's going to keep running it and be here in the village. We're in many ways keeping the money and keeping the business more vibrant by uh, doing this with them. Anyway, what I prepared was a resolution, and um, I'll go through it, and if anybody has any technical questions. But what I'd like to do is set the stage for me as the mayor to sign the agreement, but then we have to actually start to initiate it. I don't see it going live till about June. It wouldn't be active for our March water sequence, that's for sure. It might be active for our tax season. Uh, it could be a goal to shoot for. But anyway, what I'm looking for is review and authority to sign the VPS online payment documents. And I've got a few whereas is. Whereas the Village of Red Oak intends to continue steps to modernize and offer payment options to its residents and customers. Whereas the Village has no current ability to accept online payments for water bills, tax bills, or any other ability to take credit card payments for garbage tags. Whereas the Village works with Software Consulting Associates, SCA, a local company, with our tax billing and water billing software written and managed by SCA. Whereas SCA has a sister company, Verified Payment Systems, VPS, that coordinates and manages direct payment and direct bookkeeping access to SCA. Whereas the village staff will have reports, control, and review the billing process with access to our residents via our website. And whereas the village attorney has reviewed the documents and approved same. And whereas VPS offers links to C SCA that will reduce internal staff time, will offer our residents a voluntary method to pay bills, and will not cause the village any direct charges. 
whereas by municipal law, the mayor has executive authority. Be it resolved that Mayor Ed Blundell is authorized to complete and sign the requisite documents as necessary for the project to continue. The treasurer and staff will begin steps to set up links on the village's website and work with SCA and VPS to establish the program. I would offer that and ask for a second, and we could answer any questions from the board. Is there a second? No second. I, like I said, I think it's a culmination of our efforts to get here, and this looks like the answer to me. And um, as much as we do internally have some discussion who will use it, I think if it's a link on our website, we can see what happens and save a lot of processing time. For me, are, it's amazing. Are there are any indirect charges? You said direct, so I just yeah. wonder if there are indirect. The only way I can think of is, and I think we can do this, is we would have to put a button link on our website. And from what I've been told, SCA will do that as part of the deal with us. It's no, cool. Um, and then somebody at 10.30 p.m. can decide, oh, man, I didn't pay my water bill. Let me do that. And Or they can come in the next morning at 10.30 a.m. and pay a person in right here. But I'd like to experiment with it. We've been using something similar for years. Yeah, well, GovPayNet, it's a different vendor. Well, different, yeah. And we've been hunting for one that would take the look. We don't want to have direct pay and then have you guys pick up all the paperwork and then do all the back office work. This knocks off the back office work from what we can see. So anyway, we have motion second. We had a little question or discussion. Any other thoughts? I think we should do it. So, like I said, we're not looking to get it effective March 15th here or anything, but... Uh, you said June or July? I'm thinking June could be doable. From what I understand from VPS, um, they are, uh, once we sign this, we'll get an account administrator who then helps us, babysits us through. And there'll be some training on Jay's question, indirect cost. You know, the staff will have to learn how to look at the spreadsheet and see who paid overnight and make sure the wire transfer happened and things like that. But. Um, it's all web portal based. One thing I had was question on security. You'll see a section on page one. VPS is this is like IT talk, but it's PCI verified. It's a level one operation. Which what means is they um, they are security level where they actually work with the IRS and deal with IRS IT and automatic transfers. Um, Do they have a help desk for people to get tangled up? That sort of thing? Uh, it wouldn't be VPS, it'd be so software consultants. I actually had some screens and watched it. It's so simple. You click the link, it just asks you your name, account number, and what you want to pay. You put your credit card number and you hit it, and boom, it goes off. Yeah. From the help desk for our side, yeah, that, that would be our people would get some training from software consultants. The good part is, like I said, they're, I keep using the word sister companies, they're owned by the same company and they all work together so it's good um, we have contacts and names um, the money will be in our accounts in 48 hours other questions we had you know council went through them what we do it's it's a two-year agreement we thought we need a little time to get it working and then it automatically news for one-year periods unless either party cancels in 30 days um, it's going to take a little while just for our people and our staff to to figure it out, but I think it's worth it. So we have so a motion. The office is going through this transition at the same time. I think this will make it easier. That would be good. Um, we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks. Let's see. Another thing in your packet, CIT extension. When this is not on the printed agenda, but it came in, I think, today as well, didn't it, Cindy? Yes. Um, you might recall we have that tax shared services savings book that we had multiple projects in, ranging from the community solar. This uh, is an extension. It's a county program where we have rolled our police department into crisis intervention training and an acronym called BEAT, which is Behavioral Evaluation Assessment Team Patrols. It's essentially, to be sure, the responding officers can recognize um, people with mental health issues and respond properly. So the county has some funding, and if and when we send folks through the program, we can get certain reimbursements for some of our payroll costs. Um, it ran for a year, and they want to renew it for a year, which is 
fine with us. So in the paperwork there, you'll see um, the party's desire to extend the term of said contract for an additional period of one year. And um, it was mutually, mutually agreed by and between the parties. They reference a contract that we signed a year ago, dated March 20, 2019, that is hereby extended upon the following terms and conditions. And can, let's see, the condition that's changing is the term of agreement shall provide as follows the March 20, 2019 agreement, originally effective October 1, 2018, and terminated December 31, 2019, is hereby extended for additional one year and shall terminate December 31, 2020. So, staple to it, what do I have? Oh, well, there's multiple municipalities that are in it. City of Poughkeepsie, City of Beacon, Town of Poughkeepsie, Town of East Fishkill, Town of Fishkill, Town of Hyde Park, Town of Pine Plains, Village of Fishkill, Village of Millbrook, Village of Milton. It's essentially any muni that has a police department. Um, and it's operated through NAMI Mid-Hudson and Mid-Hudson Addiction Recovery Centers. So uh, the attached pages are just some blanks. Maybe they're not even attached to yours. It's attached to mine um, where each of those municipalities can sign the extension. I think it's in our interest to do it. It's in the interest of our people and our police have to respond to some tough situations. So I would recommend we agree to extend it. Um, so maybe we need to give it a resolution number. Huh? What would it be? Number nine. nine. I want to call it resolution nine. I'll craft it here quickly on the fly. The mayor is authorized on behalf of the village of Red Hook to sign the uh, extension agreement for CIT and BEAT training. Is there a second? Second. second. Any questions? All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Thanks. I think I've checked off everything I had on my agenda. Um, need to do executive session. Credit line? Pardon me? Credit line? Credit line, credit line, credit line. It's okay. Here, but okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Treasurer. Uh, another write-in for the agenda that Cindy and I discussed today. When we were doing the Treasurer's Report earlier, we were saying how we, um, I mentioned the line of credit for Salisbury Bank. We have, at the moment, a request out to New York State for our CHIPS reimbursement, which is approximately $81,000. I'm rounding it there. Um, what it does, we've funded that and paid for it through other budget lines, which you'll see are strained and over their percentages because we're carrying that cost. It's okay, but we need to get the reimbursement in, and it might not till be till June that it comes in. So we have the benefit of that low interest, 3% interest line of credit with Salisbury Bank. Um, we have circulated that the DASNY reimbursement, the $44,777 is coming in March 16th, so that'll move out of that line of credit. We do use that pocket as a resource that way. We can get reimbursable type grants and reimbursable items paid by the line of credit and then reimburse the line of credit quickly. So if we do it, if CHIPS reimburses in June like they will, we'd have two months in there, uh, April, May, three months in there picking up some interest on it. And we do budget a bit of an interest line every year for this reason. So I think to ensure protective cash flow and I think for good fiscal policy, instead of letting those other budgets strain and give us some false reads on future decisions here in April, May, and June, I guess really we just March, April, May to be more accurate. Um, I would recommend that we do this. Um, generally, of course, the board has to concur and then we would talk to Salisbury Bank, but we do have it sitting there as a tool. Um, the 44 will come out in a week. This would go in, and it's a, it's a $200,000 line of credit that we have, so we're not straining that. So I put together some wording, essentially saying the Village of Red Hook is eligible for New York State CHIPS funds to upgrade and improve its streets and related infrastructure and complied with purchasing standards. The village selected appropriate contractors and suppliers who completed street and drainage improvement projects as capital improvements eligible for CHIPS reimbursement with costs of approximately $81,000. And whereas the village utilizes its highway department to coordinate the projects, but the major contractual costs are charged against cash flow to await reimbursement, 
creating a cash flow restriction. Whereas the CHIPS program utilizes a reimbursement methodology and the village has incurred the cost, paid the contractors, and submitted our request to CHIPS. Whereas the village also has a line of credit with Salisbury Bank at 3% interest. Therefore, be it resolved, the village treasurer is authorized to utilize the line of credit from Salisbury Bank to cover the cost submitted to CHIPS. The mayor and or treasurer are authorized to exercise the line of credit up to the amount of the installation and material costs up to $80,000. With a line of credit option utilized, the village will re use reimbursement receipts amount to pay down the line of credit accordingly and reduce the amount borrowed from Salisbury Bank to a zero balance for this activity. So it's, the goal is get, get it out into our cash flow, and then as soon as we get reimbursed, reimburse, you know, pay back Salisbury Bank. I would offer it and ask for a second, and I guess we need a number. What would that be? Second. Is there a second? Second. Any other thoughts or concerns? So have we submitted our, our reimbursement request to uh, DOT for tips? Mm -hmm. So that was done in March? And no, it was done last week. Last week. Yeah. Good. What, what bothered me is we won't get it till June, so I think we're better served ourselves this way. Any other questions or discussion? Uh, call to a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. We have from the audience time for you to talk. Any public comment? If there is, Mr. George, would you like to check, 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 check? Um, my, my question would be, you talked about the um, uh, Airbnbs, yeah. which doesn't affect us immediately now, but is that listed in our book, in the zoning book? Is that phrase Airbnb actually in the book no. anywhere? Either a short-term rental, either one is not, not right. listed. So well, that would I, be a change I, I, of use. I'm sorry, George, I didn't hear Brent's answer. What, what, I you, said no, yeah, okay. and either is a short-term rental. So that would not be allowed currently. That is that is correct. Right. My suggestion, if you're going to do, do ever do it, you put in the R20,000 zone. They have more property around them, more privacy, and they're less likely to annoy the neighbors. But less disruption. The village hasn't really got to the point of discussing. Yeah, I, I just bring in because I don't yeah. remember seeing it in the book. And I, I know the I town is, it. you know, the town is working on theirs, which is a lot different animal than the village and. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been worked on, nothing's been submitted formally as a recommendation to the town board for consideration at this point. They're still going through public comment period hearings and you know trying to solicit some opinions from other right, groups and organizations. Right, but it's not currently in our, our Currently board. it's not permitted. Anybody operating one would technically be violating the zoning code. True. Correct. There's no enforcement of that at this point. Correct. Our code basically says that if it does not expressly say that you can do it, then you cannot. Right. And that's the only thing I'm just asking, pointing out that uh, allowing them to continue, and if you're going to do it, at least put it in the R10,000, 20,000 zone, and it, which most people may not want to give up the privacy in their 400,000, 500,000 dollar homes, because generally have more property around them. But there's but a lot of it issues. It would limit it, state, right? That yeah. would limit the number of out, out there in the future. So, yeah, I just throw that out. I have no yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> argument with you. <laughs> no good. Yeah, I think we would. Yeah, the, the big thing to me is it didn't exist ten years ago, and um, it's out there now, and it's self-governing, self-managing, and it's it's a huge, huge part of the economy. But anyway, thank you, George. Anybody else? With that, like I said, we don't need to do executive session. Any other comment from the board? Any questions? Or items we will meet Thursday and hopefully move our tentative budget to conclusion and then get that out and then um, with that we do have vouchers moving up and down I didn't look at the sewer ones yet but the other ones I guess everybody saw them so Mr. Brent would you uh, I, I guess I'll do the pay bills part of it we need to pay them and keep everybody happy so I move that we pay those bills after they've been audited, and it sounds like they've been audited by the board. So I move we get them paid. Is there a second? Second. And then, Mr. Brent, if you consider us done, I would. I would consider us done, and I can make a motion to adjourn this evening's meeting. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Thanks, everybody.
I know that 